I'm Grant Oliphant, and this is We Can Be. On this season of We Can Be, as we're focusing on those in the social change arena who are bridging divides, we've thought about the elements necessary to even attempt to find the common ground that will allow us to create a more just world for all. One of those key elements is accurate, respected, and easy to communicate data about who we actually are as a nation. Today's guest has been at the forefront of just that for nearly four decades. William H. Fry is the author of Diversity Explosion, How New Racial Demographics Are Remaking America. He is also an internationally renowned demographer and senior fellow of the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institute. He is a research professor with the University of Michigan's Institute for Social Research and Population Studies Center, has authored over 200 publications, and has been a consultant to the U.S. Census Bureau. His current research agenda involves examining 2020 U.S. Census practices and results, tracking voter trends associated with the 2020 presidential primary and general election, and monitoring demographic aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. If you're thinking Bell sounds familiar, you've likely read or heard about his work in dozens of media outlets, including The Economist, Forbes, The New Yorker, NPR's All Things Considered, NBC, CBS, ABC, and The Washington Post. He is acutely skilled at taking complicated data and helping us understand what it says about who we are and where we are going. The census, it's how the US government says, everyone in the country makes some noise. Every 10 years, the census determines how many people are in the country and then how many congressional seats each state gets. Two million four, two million five. The U.S. Census isn't just a population count. It helps allocate federal, state, and local funds to your community. You can answer Census 2000 and get what you need. Or you can leave it blank and get this. Nothing. Bill, thank you so much for being here and for doing this. Oh, it's a pleasure. Let's start with a big question. What are some of the main things that you think the 2020 census will reveal about America? I think one of the biggest things it will reveal is that we'll have the slowest rate of growth of any decade in the nation's history, maybe 6.8% or something like that, even slower than during the Great Depression. Part of the reason of it is we have an aging population. Uh, This was a particular decade uh, where for the last part of it, fertility has gone down as millennials started putting off having children and putting off getting married. And then we've had restrictions on immigration. Uh, Now, remember, the 2020 census will not fully take into account the pandemic's impact on immigration or fertility or mortality and all of those things, maybe a small bit of it. Mm -hmm. So this even happened before the pandemic. And what it tells us is that perhaps the next decade will be uh, another slow growing decade and probably beyond after that, unless we have huge volumes of immigration to the United States. Related to that, we're going to have an aging population, the over age 55 population, will grow by about 27 percent. The underage 55 population will be grow only by about 1 percent. The bigger part of that decline will be the younger part of the population, the underage 20 population, due again to the fertility decline and, and so forth. A third piece of it is, is we're going to become much more racially diverse, especially among our younger population. Probably the people under age 18 will be uh, minority white, as they say, that there'll be more people of color and people who identify as white. And it may be the first decade where we actually have an overall decline in the white population. If we don't, it'll be a very, very small gain. Whites have a median age of about 44. Latinos have a median age of about 30 or 31. People of two or more races have a median age of about 21. So uh, you have this kind of older white population, proportionately fewer women in their childbearing ages, and not a lot of white immigration to the U.S. So uh, all of our growth going forward will be growth in people of color. People attach value judgments to growth or not. And for some folks, slow growth is fine. When you present this data around the slowest growth in perhaps a century, is that a problem? Well, I think it's a problem because it connects to the aging of our population. Mm -hmm. 
typically growth occurs among the younger part of the population, obviously births, <laughs> right, but, also, right, but yeah. also immigrants who tend to be immigrants and their children tend to have a younger age structure than the rest of the population. I think the aging of the population is an issue we're going to have to grapple with. I mean, you know, if we continue to have this very slow growth in this in the younger population, those are the people who are going to be in their labor force ages. Ten years from now, the very last baby boomer will turn age 65. That's a big chunk of the population populations that are moving into the kind of retirement ages, uh, these younger groups uh, are going to have to support them. So lots of countries are aging. We're actually not aging as much as, as some other countries. Japan is probably the most extreme case, but a lot of Eastern European countries, Italy, Germany, to some degree, we've been lucky because we've had a lot of immigration over the last 20 or 30 years, which has helped to bolster our, the younger part of our population. Thank you for that, because I think people forget how much depends on the growth and vitality of the population. So it's important to point that out. The obvious hot button of the last five, six years in the demography space has been about the point you were making with regards to the white population. And I can remember prior to the 2016 election, uh, watching a particular newscast in which the anchor was talking about the declining white population in the United States and saying, in effect, that Republicans were making a bad bet by thinking that they could bank their entire future on white America because there weren't, wasn't enough of white America to sustain them. You wrote in a report last year that whites declined as a share of the population in 96% of all U.S. counties between 2010 and 2018. And in your book, Diversity Explosion, you say that America is getting less white and that will save it. What do you mean by that? Yes, I think that goes back to the population growth issue. The white population isn't going to change very much one way or another because we don't have a lot of white immigration. These are largely people of color, people from Latin America, people from Asia, people from Africa. So as we get immigration to save us from a shrinking population, shrinking because the white population is aging very rapidly, that's going to involve people of color. And uh, that means that, you know, we're going to have a much more multi-hued population going forward. I don't think racial identity is going to be so important for us going into the future. I think we have leaders that try to make this a kind of a division issue, you know, either white or you're not white, and Americans should be white and have white attitudes and so forth. You know, we're, we're a country actually that have benefited a lot from immigration in our longer history, bringing in people with different backgrounds and languages that have helped us prosper and, and actually put us on the front burner of, of economic success in a good part of the 20th century. So this whiteness thing, I think, is uh, something used by politicians to get, to get some votes, and it's not going to last too much longer if you count the number of people who are going to be voting in the next couple of decades. America is quickly becoming much more diverse, radically changing the politics of our states and our parties. It matters because it has huge election ramifications. Yeah. Any state that has a rising Latino-Hispanic population is seeing its politics change before your very eyes. The United States is also becoming younger, and those are all trends that benefit Democrats and hurt Republicans. Republicans have not only been in denial about this issue, but they've actually been moving backward. What do you say to folks who are really find what you're describing to be terrifying in terms of their view of what America is, and how can data help convince yeah. them um, that this transition is a good thing for America that they don't need to be afraid of? I mean, in some ways, I understand it a bit. I'm 73. I'm an old baby boomer. I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s, where immigration to the United States was at its low point or near to its low point. The black population was highly, highly segregated, much more segregated than it is today. So unless you lived in New York or Detroit or someplace like that, you didn't encounter a lot of people of color and you certainly didn't count a lot of young immigrants coming to the U.S. So this is the population now that's in their 60s and 70s and 80s. Some of them actually became liberal in their young period of time and were open to diversity and open to inclusion, but not enough of them, apparently, to make this population susceptible to political 
pronouncements that America is changing in a negative way and it's not what you grew up with. The America that we know and love doesn't exist anymore. Massive demographic changes have been foisted upon the American people. And they're changes that none of us ever voted for and most of us don't like. Latin American countries are changing election outcomes here by forcing demographic change on this country at a rate that American voters consistently say they don't want. Put out welcome wagons, pile them high, because you know, we're just going to consign tens of thousands, perhaps millions of Americans to their deaths. You know, the idea of making America great again is that's how it was in the 1950s when you were growing up. So, you know, it's a fraud argument. And I think, mm. you know, what you need is a, an equally vocal leader who can sort of counter that with the kind of demographic statistics that I have saying, no, these are the people that are going to support you in retirement. <laughs> it's right. the only way right. that's going to happen. Right. And on top mm. of it, they're going to be taking care of you physically in your retirement home. I see what's happened in 2016, not just with Donald Trump, but with other people who've tried to make some political gain out of this. That can change as, as people get to see how the country really is changing and the contributions people are making who are of color. The oldest millennial has just turned 40 this year. Wow. And wow. so <laughs> the millennial generation is, you know, about 55 percent white, 45 percent people of color, probably 10 or 12 states for more than half the millennial population are people of color. These are people going to be making decisions. They're going to be out there in the front it's going to happen gradually. People don't accept change immediately. I mean, the place where I think people are more accepting of these changes are places where diversity occurred first, like California, where this argument is more challenging to make, is in parts of the country where the diversity hasn't yet been seen. There, I think it's, it's, it's incumbent of, of party leaders, of politicians, of civic leaders to kind of make this case. There is a terrible tendency, particularly driven by politics, I think, right now, to classify everybody as either white or people of color. We've seen how that sorting of people according to white and people of color or white and non-white is a perfect us against them narrative for people who are interested in pushing a white supremacist agenda. How might these categories have to change in the future? Well, I do think that uh, one of the fastest growing populations in the U.S. are people who identify themselves as multiracial. For the first time in the 2000 census, the Census Bureau allowed people to write down more than one race. So you could be white and black or white and Asian and so forth. So the broader point is the more people we have that identify this way, and there's going to be because there's a big explosion in multiracial marriages. So the children of those marriages and how they identify themselves may be the open question now. And But I think if you project all of that ahead, you're going to have a much big share of the population. The broader thing is, I think, as people get to see this, that it's not just white and everybody else, but it'll be white and some kind of merger of, you know, all of these different kinds of groups. That that's how the country will be able to see these kinds of changes. Now, it's not going to stop these very radical white supremacist groups from making the case. And I think, unfortunately, because of the... the politicians of the last four years, it's given credence to people who prior to that would have been seen as kind of fringe extreme groups. And they're now becoming a little bit, you know, more mainstream. I'll have to look at this January 6th thing that we right, saw down at the right, Capitol. Exactly. But I'm hopeful that that's just going to be a sideshow. There will be some group of people that will be like that. They right. won't be enough to make that big of a difference. Unfortunately, the Census Bureau's classification under-enumerates multiracial people because hmm. it has a separate question for Hispanic status, which they see as an ethnicity, and for the other racial groups, white, black, Asian Americans, uh, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and so forth. And what happens when you see Census Bureau statistics for the multiracial population, you don't see Hispanics involved. So if you have someone who's a Hispanic father and a white mother, they will check Hispanic on the Hispanic question, but white only on the race question. The Census Bureau really wanted to put Hispanic as part of the race question for the 2020 census but it was vetoed by the Trump administration's Office of Management and Budget. So we're once again going to have uh, a difficult time identifying people who are multi-race where Hispanic is one of those categories. And since Hispanic is the biggest minority group in the country, about 18 percent of the population are Hispanic right now, that makes a problem. Now, when I analyze interracial marriages, I do include Hispanics. Mm -hmm. And there is about one out of 10 marriages 
are interracial in the United States. About 16% of recent marriages are interracial in the United States. Uh, so when the Census Bureau comes around to identifying people using the Hispanic category in there, then you'll see more interracial uh, parts of the population moving ahead. It still means that white will have some meaning, but I think as we become more I don't know, integrated in all kinds of ways that that may, that may go away. Uh, politicians are the best demographers in a way. They know how to count the votes. They know how to count the people that are out there. And sooner or later, they're going to figure this out. I think they're thinking about this more heavily in Georgia and Arizona today than they had maybe three or four months right. ago. Yeah, good point. <laughs> we helped Mommy fill out our census form. And we mailed it back. But why? Because everybody counts in the census form. As I think about how awareness of these issues is distributed around the country, I'm remembering a slogan adopted by L.A. a decade ago was, America only sooner. I thought that perfectly captured a sense of where the country was going in terms of the diversity of the country. And yet it's wildly unequally distributed. So we know that there's much more diversity around the coasts than there is in the center of the country. And there's good data to prove precisely what you said, that the less people are familiar with diversity, the more they're afraid of it. But you actually do see the country beginning to meld in ways that some of the rest of us, maybe because we're paying too much attention to the media, miss. And as recently as the 1990s, you said the racial map of the U.S. could be broken down into three main categories— melting pot, heartland, and new sunbelt. Do you still think those three hold up, and is that where we're headed? I think we're changing a lot. I mean, getting back to where I was back in the 90s, I was quite concerned about when immigrant groups came to the U.S., they tended to stay put when they came to these melting pot states and melting pot metros like Los Angeles or Houston or Miami or New York City didn't spread out much. And during that particular time, a lot of the growth in the country economically was moving away from those states. They were moving to a good part of the Sun Belt, Georgia, North Carolina, and in the West, Nevada, Utah, uh, Arizona, and so forth. So the white population or the native-born population, sometimes the black population too, were moving into those other states, but the new immigrants were kind of staying put so I wrote a, uh, several articles about what I then called the balkanization of the United States and how this is going to be an issue in terms of racial integration and so forth. But being a demographer and being around a long time, I kept looking at the numbers. And when I got into the 2000 census in particular, I saw that uh, that's not happening anymore. There, There is this dispersion, I, see, I think, especially in Arizona and Nevada, which I had as uh, not one of the melting pot states to begin with. And I think we're going to see more of it in the West and as well as in the South, you know, moving to Georgia, moving to North Carolina, moving to Virginia. You know, when, when there's jobs, that's what attracts people. Young people who are looking for jobs are going to go to those places and take those jobs, Latinos, Asians, people like that. Bill, you've written that the initial reaction of folks in those communities includes an initial backlash among existing residents who are uncomfortable with the changing population in their school systems and community life. Can we expect that initial backlash to settle down over time? You know, I, I think it can. I do think we have need political leadership, whether at the governor level, whether at the county commissioner level, whether they're at the mayor level, to understand the way the country is changing and to try to educate, especially the older generations, to understand why this is so important. And then the only way our community is going to be able to grow jobs and be economically successful is to be able to track the people that are out there. And today, this is going to be a big mix of people from different origins, who its parents are from different origins. You know, this is this is good for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so there's a lot of talk about the millennial population. And you've written that America's millennial population, generally considered to be those born between 1981 and 1996, is the demographic bridge to America's diverse future. You've talked a little bit about how that's true from a number standpoint, but what more do you mean by that? Well, I think this is a generation that is, is more inclusive. Their, their ideas are more inclusive. Millennials who get married are much more likely to be involved in interracial marriages than people of those same ages 
earlier, 14% of millennial marriages are interracial marriages. Mm. It was like 5% for baby boomers when they were at the same age. A very high percentage of them are first and second generation Americans, especially Latino and Asian members of the millennial generation. The white millennial population also, surveys have shown, are much more open to inclusiveness in all these different dimensions, uh, as they say, interracial marriages, immigration reform, criminal justice. That's the way the country is going to change, but they're going to bring with them those values. They're also the most educated generation of their age. They're going to be in positions of leadership. Not only will they have the older people perhaps to try to convince, but a much bigger number of younger people who will be on the bandwagon already. What do they represent in terms of political heft, do you think? So I think you've given us a good sense of their attitudes, but how significant are they politically? Well, I think I calculated that millennials and Gen Zers uh, in this last election were 37% of the eligible voter population which is about the same as it is for baby boomers, I believe. We may have to go back and check that. But it's, it's, it's a big chunk. Now, in elections, young people don't turn out as much as older people do. We don't have yet the final numbers in turnout for 2020, but we will in a couple of weeks, I think. And I think we'll see that their turnout is probably a lot bigger than people of that age and earlier presidential elections. When you look at states that are younger and rapidly growing, and usually rapidly growing states are both younger and more racially diverse, uh, and that's where the Sun Belt is coming into the picture. We saw it with Arizona. We saw it with Georgia. We saw it a few elections ago with Virginia and then back in 2008 for North Carolina and then occasionally with Florida. Uh, so those are fast growing Sun Belt states that are becoming more racially diverse. And those are states where millennials, I think, will have some of the bigger impacts going forward. Research shows that millennials tend to be liberal and, unlike their predecessors, they aren't becoming more conservative as they get older. Political scientists say it's because most of their lives they've known economic insecurity. And not only were they hit with the Great Recession on this side of entering the job market, but now they're dealing with the pandemic at the height of when they should be able to earn their biggest earning potential. Millennials have also seen climate change intensify natural disasters like wildfires and hurricanes. And as America's most diverse adult generation, they're more concerned than their elders about racial justice and LGBTQ rights. But there are signs that millennials may be taking their activism from the streets to the ballot boxes. In 2018, their turnout was double what it was in the last midterm elections, helping Democrats recapture the House. You were um, interviewed for a September 2020 Politico piece in which you described the 2020 census as a brush with catastrophe. Would you say a little bit more about why and how we avoid that in 2030? My discussion there was the Trump administration uh, trying to force the Census Bureau first to put a citizenship question on the 2020 census, which most research shows would keep a lot of people from answering the question. Uh, and therefore making the census you know, much less precise, especially for certain states, especially for certain cities and so forth. And then when that didn't happen, the Trump administration then decided they were going to try to use other means to figure out what the undocumented population was and subtract those numbers from the final results of the 2020 census. Almost a year ago, the Census Bureau said because of the pandemic, they were going to delay their operations because it was going to take them a long time to follow up people who had moved and so forth. And there was a good likelihood that they could not deliver the final results of the census in December of 2020, as the law provides, that they wanted to be able to deliver those results in April of 2021. The Trump administration sort of forced them to backtrack on that because he figured he may not be president in April right. of 2020. Right. So as a result, you know, he was forcing them to like stop all their operations and curtail all their follow up and make sure that he could have numbers on his desk by the end of December. And that was the kind of thing that I was writing about there. I was I was right. was an attempt to defend the professionals at the, at the Census Bureau from this kind of heavy handedness, which I thought was dangerous for the census and a dangerous precedent to set. But fortunately, Trump lost the election. And uh, the new administration has given the Census Bureau a great deal of time to go back and try to redo all of that. There will not be a, a subtraction of undocumented immigrants from the census results. And they actually uh, 
what's called the redistricting file, which is the real details of race and age and gender at the small area level, which is used to create congressional districts. That will not be out until September. They're going to take a lot of time to be able to figure out that they have the right numbers. It would seem that the way we avoid making the same error in 2030 is to keep politics out of the counting Actually, people, I think, forget that the relative independence of American data, demography, and statisticians has been one of our great strengths as a country. What are some of the things that you find to be most important in terms of how COVID has affected who we are as a country? From a demographic point of view, I can't tell you how many times, at least once a week, I get a call from a reporter wanting to know if people are going to go back to New York City, (laughs) which at this point, I think there are now stories written that everybody's going back to New York City. But, uh, you know, I think the real question is how temporary these kinds of migrations are, how temporary is the idea that people are working from home. I mean, from a demographic standpoint, I mean, where people live, how people move, where people work, you know, it's going to take a few years to figure out what the long-term impacts of all of that will be. Obviously, there's the um, class divide stuff that clearly is being impacted by the pandemic, the, you know, the essential workers who've been hit very hard by this, who, you know, had higher rates of infection, especially people of color, uh, and, and have really been, um, you know, behind it in terms of getting enough employment, getting a lot of income, uh, being able to pay their rent, all right. of these things. Are, are, are for a, a big segment of the population, then there's another segment of the population that hasn't been hit very hard by it. So that's something that will also uh, be important to monitor as we get through this pandemic. So there's a lot of that real that deals with demography, whether it's migration, whether it's inequality, whether it's you know racial inequality, all of that uh, is going to have have to be looked at and. Uh, and assessed as we get out of this thing. One of the issues that has arisen, obviously, in the context of COVID is how kids learn. Um, but you've also written about the importance of, of investing in kids and education in the context of already of a country that's experiencing slower growth and forecasting more. And you talk about why it is so important to invest more in children. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? I mean, I think investing in children is always needs to be a top priority for a country, irrespective of what the demography is. But I think there's a demographic perspective on this, too. And, and again, it goes back to the aging of the population and the slow growth of the younger population and the diversity of the younger population. So back in 1960, about 35 percent of the population was under age 18. We're moving down to more like 20% in the next 10 years or so. And what that tells you is that that younger population is going to be eventually a much smaller part of that labor force that's going to have to, again, support this older population. So it's even more, it's not only important for these young people to have good careers and successful lives and all of those things, they're going to be supporting an aging population, but, but a much smaller base of them. On top of it, the only reason we're growing our child population as much as we are right now is due to people of color in between 2010 and 2019. Uh, actually, since 2000 and 2019, uh, the underage 18 population has is totally grown by people of color, especially Latinos, but also Asians and blacks and people of two or more races. But there's this huge inequality in educational attainment among those groups between black and brown people on the one hand and Asian and whites on the other hand. What I think is that, and, and we're seeing some of this with the current administration and this broader view of trying to uh, give people relief from the pandemic, but also maybe infrastructure going forward, that there's more attention and let's give some federal resources to these young people, not not just put it on the state and local level, understanding that this is really important for us, not just for them, but also for us as a nation, that this child population is successful, be able to get uh, post-secondary education, college educations that are relevant to jobs, relevant to joining the middle class. This is close to a crisis level. I mean, I think we really need to, to put this near the very top of our, our priorities as a country, as, as the younger population, giving them opportunities. And thank you for saying that. I think that's a profound statement and right. But what happens if we don't do it, if we don't respond to the crisis? It's like a lot of other demographic phenomena. We won't know that we're in trouble until it's too late. I think I calculated by 2030, 
uh, the 18 to 29 year old population will be minority white in the United States. So that's a younger part of the labor force. And that's still a, about 40% of those, those kids are going to be black and brown who still have this kind of lower levels of educational attainment. We don't want that to happen going forward. I think Hemingway was the one who said that bankruptcy happens in two stages really slowly and then all at once. I guess the same <laughs> is true of demographic shifts. Yeah. I'm curious if you have any advice for Pittsburgh, which, um, you know, our region is, is emblematic of many of the trends that you're describing. We have a surprisingly low Asian and Hispanic population because of the economic collapse of industry 50 years ago and the impacts of that are lingering still and we have a, a significant uh, have had a significant out migration of a black population in Pittsburgh and strong strong issues in the community with racism and relatively low birth rates compared to deaths and so forth. The community likes to believe that we're coming out of that. But I'm, I'm curious, as you look at a place like Pittsburgh, what you might think is important for us to keep in mind. Again, the idea is that if there's going to be growth, it means attracting people of color, because that's the younger part of the population today. So I think Pittsburgh can expect that, even though it's not there by uh, quite a stretch right now. I think that when those opportunities arise, whether they be in high tech jobs, education related jobs, which I know there's a lot of that incubation going on in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. that's the population that that's going to be coming. And, and there needs to be that openness to it. The, and there needs to be, you know, a uh, reaching out to that kind of population. And, and so I think that there are lots of uh, cities in, in, uh, in the Midwest and in Pennsylvania that are, um, you know, struggling with these kinds of demographic issues. But I think help is on the way <laughs> from a demographic standpoint. I love that, by the way, and that notion of help is on the way. It's it's such a great way of thinking about it. Uh, and I've totally enjoyed this conversation. The name of this program is We Can Be. And I love to conclude by asking my guest to complete that thought. We can be what? Oh, we can be a great, diverse model country for the rest of the world if we accept all the immigrants and the new Americans in the same way we had in earlier parts of our history. We have to take advantage of the fact that people want to come here and be successful here and allow that to happen. If there is one common thread that runs through much of my conversation with William, it is the matter-of-fact way he says again and again that diversity is what will fuel the future of our country. And that is good for us. Black and brown citizens and an increasingly progressive young population will dominate spending power, population increases, and eventually the care of our older citizens. While having the census as an apolitical baseline of truth about who we are is enormously important, it is what we do with that information that will determine how unified or how divided we will be as we face that future. William believes the backlash we're experiencing over the reality of our multiracial and multicultural population can settle. But in his words, it will take political leadership, whether at the governor level, the county commissioner level, or at the mayoral level, to understand how the country is changing and help educate us as to why this is so important and why this is good for us. It is this calm and fact-based approach to interpreting the fabric that is our country that has earned William Fry the respect of so many over the past four decades quote a title of one of his books, The Diversity Explosion That Our Nation Has Been Witnessing in Recent Years, has the potential to make us stronger, smarter, more accepting, and more economically powerful. To recognize that is not divisive, and it does not make us weaker. What it makes us is realists. What it makes us is better and closer to our ideals as a nation. Whether we realize that potential is in our hands and that of the leaders we elect.